Every piece of technology we currently rely on was once nothing more than a blueprint and a dream in someone's mind. Sadly, not everything that's drawn up as a blueprint works out in the real world. Sometimes after a prototype has been built, an idea simply turns out to be unworkable, usually because it's physically or financially impractical. In this video, we're going to be checking out some of history's great near misses in terms of vehicles and technology. The Kalanin K-7 was intended to be the future of aviation in the Soviet Union, a plane capable of heavy bombing duties and also civilian transport. Unusually for a plane of any kind, the seating for civilians was inside the plane's wings, which were over seven feet thick. Pods underneath the rings housed machine gun turrets and landing gear. Eight powerful engines were required to get the behemoth of a plane into the sky. For 1933, it was a remarkable feat of engineering. The wingspan was similar to the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, but its larger wing area made it one of the largest planes ever to be built prior to the invention of the jet. Up to 120 civilians could be housed aboard for transport duties or 112 paratroopers for times of battle. With the remaining space being taken up by over 21,000 pounds of bombs, initial test flights in August 1933 identified serious issues with vibration and subsequent works to try to correct the issues only seemed to make them worse. Seven further test flights later, the Kalanin K-7 crashed when the structure of a tail boom failed. The project was discontinued. When people try to combine two or more different methods of transport together, the results are either phenomenal or disastrous. There's usually no middle ground. We might have to make an exception to that rule for the Argo, designed by Nikolovich Melenchenko in 1960. It doesn't look like a vehicle that could be driven underwater, but as the designer never got as far as fitting an engine to the chassis and giving it a try, we'll probably never know. As well as being suitable for driving on roads or across rivers, the Argo was heavily armored, so the designer hoped the military would enthusiastically subscribe to his idea. Sadly, they showed no interest, and so without funding, Melnichenko eventually had to give up with the concept car part built. What we know of the car from studying his notes is exciting. The Argo's eight wheels generated power and conveyed it back to the engine via the hydraulic system, so it would have been very fuel efficient. Even toward the end of the Second World War, the Nazis were known to have several secret weapons under construction. One of them was the Seetafel, also known as the Sea Devil, or the Elephant. The vessel was a midget submarine with a crew of two capable of speedy hit-and-run missions against larger ships. For its time, the Seetafel would have been considered advanced. It was 46 feet long, moved at 9 miles per hour, and could descend to depths of 70 feet below sea level. The real genius of the design was a set of tracks below the hull, which allowed the ship to get on and off beaches without assistance. In essence, it could self-launch. Sea devils could carry mines or torpedoes when underwater, or machines and flamethrowers when on land. Sea devils were ready to go into production at the start of 1945, but an increasingly under-pressure German command decided to focus on existing models instead of spending money on untested ships and weapons. The one prototype was destroyed when the war ended. The reason that you don't see Soviet Atlant planes in the air is all down to the failure of the Buran as USSR's answer to the space shuttle. Transporting the Buran was a difficult job, and one for which the AN-124 Ruslan and AN-225 Maria planes simply weren't suitable. A solution had to be found, and the Atlant planes were that solution. At their core, the planes were M3M strategic bombers, planes which were known to have great aerodynamic design and sturdy landing gear. Even with that advantage, the M3Ms had to be extensively modified to cope with the demands of flying the Buran through the air. The fuselage was lengthened, the chassis was reinforced, and a more powerful engine was fitted. Once the upgrade was complete, the Atlant planes could transport the Buran and parts of its launch vehicle simply by having the pieces strapped to their backs. Numerous successful test flights were carried out in 1981, but when Buran failed, the planes were left without a purpose. 
We've seen many countries attempt to unlock the potential of maglev trains, which levitate above the rails using magnetic power with various degrees of success. There's a road in Pueblo, Colorado, which stands as testimony to a previous American attempt to make maglev technology work. The Grumman Tracked Levitation Research Vehicle was said to be capable of moving at speeds of over 300 miles an hour because friction between the train and track was eliminated. It should have been a transport revolution. Unfortunately, someone had made a very foolish error. The test track wasn't long enough, and so the vehicle didn't have enough room to build up to its top speed. The Urban Mass Transport Administration lost interest in the project during the 1970s and stopped funding it. Since then, it's been shipped from museum to museum and is now waiting for a hovercraft museum to open so it can be the star of the show. Until then, it just stands forgotten next to an everyday road. There was no shortage of ambition when the Soviets conceived the vehicle known simply as Object 760 back in the 1960s. Despite the inauspicious name, had the Object 76 project been successful, it may have been a significant step forward for land-based combat. The vehicle is basically an armored hovercraft, which used an air cushion for improved maneuverability. The initial tests were promising. It proved to be faster and more agile than the PT-76 light tank over challenging surfaces like snow and marshland, as well as being able to enter terrain that the PT-76 couldn't. Even better, it didn't detonate mines as it passed over the top of them. As a prototype vehicle, though, it had an obvious drawback from a military point of view. It didn't carry any weapons. While adding weapons to the existing design might have seemed like the obvious thing to do, the Soviets instead scrapped Object 760 and moved on to Object 761 instead, the BDRM VPK light amphibious tank. Another exciting Soviet development could have been the Battle Mole, a sort of submarine which tunnels through the earth, digging out tunnels as it goes. The military advantages of such a device are obvious. It could tunnel directly beneath enemy lines and attack from beneath, penetrating straight into the heart of bunkers and bases. Peter Raskazova is believed to have drawn up the first plans for such a device in 1904, but lost his life in 1905 and wasn't able to follow up on them. It wasn't until the 1930s that Alexander Trebelev set about the task of trying to see if there was value in Raskalova's ideas. How far Trebelev got with this device is shrouded in mystery. It's not a secret the Soviets ever told. It's generally believed that a working prototype was made and was informally referred to as the Battle Mole. Said to be 100 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, and packing a nuclear weapon, some say that the design was finally ready to be tested in 1964. After that, nothing was heard again, and it was speculated that the Battle Mole had exploded underground. We are staying in Russia for a moment, because the Russians are still having fascinating ideas today like the B-Reev BE-2500 Neptune aircraft. The 2500 part of the name is taken from its maximum takeoff weight, which is expected to be 2500 tons. It will be the largest amphibious transport aircraft ever created if the project makes it all the way through to completion. But the chances aren't looking good. There's been no news about the Neptune since 2012, the adaptable vehicle would have worked similarly to a jet plane for transcontinental flights, but more like a hovercraft using the ground effect when moving over high seas at high speed. Making such a plane has long been an obsession for b -Reeve. They've been working on it ever since the ill-fated VVA-14 project of the 1970s. They say that the BE-2500 Neptune would be a flying ship and would present a realistic alternative to all existing air transport solutions as well as conducting commercial flights. Why has there been no news for seven years? We can only assume that like the VVA-14, it ran into issues it couldn't overcome. Yet another attempt to introduce amphibious qualities to another mode of transport came from the Americans during the 1950s in the shape of the Chrysler TV-8. Chrysler had a reputation for great ideas and quality products but their TV-8 tank wasn't one of them. 
The TV-8 was envisioned as a nuclear-powered tank that could do battle both on land and at sea, but it never made it into production. The design was lightweight for a tank, coming in at only 25 tons. A 90mm gun was mounted to the turret along with a hydraulic ram with 50-point caliber machine guns added to that just for good measure. There was even a rudimentary form of closed-circuit television to protect the crew inside from the flashes of nuclear explosions if they ever encountered them. Because the turret was watertight and kitted out with water jet pumps, it could have been capable of floating and propulsion in water. Despite this, the design was deemed to have no significant advantages over a regular tank, so it was shelved in 1956. You might have heard the phrase whirlybird used to describe a helicopter before now. That phrase has an origin. Nobody knew what to call the helicopter before it was invented, so Maitland B. Bleeker called his conceptual device the whirlybird during its development. Bleeker was an engineer working alongside Curtis Wright in the construction of what is now known as the Curtis Bleeker helicopter during the 1920s. The primitive rotary wing aircraft was years ahead of its time. Their Whirlybird had one single engine, but individual propellers for each rotor. The stick control wasn't unlike the type used in modern helicopters, whereas the foot pedals pivoted the aircraft using downwash from the rotors. Bleeker and Curtis were very, very close to having a perfect model they could get into the air, but kept coming up against the vibration issue. When they lost funding for their project during the Great Depression in 1933, they believed themselves to be one part away from success. Sightings of UFOs were common back in the 1930s and 1940s, and we may now know why. People weren't seeing alien spacecraft, they were seeing experimental planes like the Nemeth Parasol, which was known as the Nemeth Roundwing. Although the idea of planes with saucer-shaped sails instead of wings might now seem laughable, they were briefly thought to be plausible. In the case of the Nemeth aircraft, it even had a few successful test flights. The parasol was a tail dragger built around the frame of an Alliance Argo biplane from the 1920s. Because it was so small, some of the press who saw it fly hyped it as a parachute plane that you could own and land in your backyard. We have no evidence it was ever intended to be used that way. Stephen P. Nemeth believed that his invention was foolproof and that anybody could be taught to fly it with less than 30 minutes training. It's thought that the low wing aspect ratio might have caused drag issues, but aside from that, it's unclear why we're not all parking Nemeth planes in our garages today. You should never fault an inventor for thinking big. And George Benny was definitely thinking big when he came up with the idea of his propeller-driven plane. In the future that Benny saw, the railways of England would deliver nothing but goods and mail, and all the passengers would be transported above the rails on specially built tracks, carried along by his new invention. Benny's plane on rails would have been faster than the trains of the 1930s, and although executing the idea would have involved a complete overhaul of the existing railway system, it seemed like a fundamentally good idea. A short test track was built near Glasgow in Scotland, and Benny's device seemed to work perfectly. Somehow he wasn't able to convince a sufficient number of investors of the worth of his project, and so he had to accept defeat after sinking all of his life savings into the prototype. Perhaps ripping up every railroad in Great Britain was just too big a task to sell the government. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.